Thank you so much. So good evening to everyone. Let me start in Ukrainian and let me introduce our today's lecturer in Ukrainian and then we'll go over to the English lecture and then we will speak and we will see what language we speak. Okay, so once again, good evening to everyone. I'm Sofia Diak and on behalf of the Center for Urban History, let me welcome you at our first lecture in February and with this lecture we go on with a series that we launched back in 2022. This is the series called uh, A Source as a Choice and I can really tell you that in 2022 in the summertime we had a conference in Zachend in Warsaw, Warsaw. Probably during the discussion we will get back to this topic. I heard Louisa's speech there I heard her presentation and really wanted her to make this presentation here. Some time has elapsed and finally Louisa is here. Because she is really a busy lecturer. She is a lecturer professor of the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. She is a researcher. She is a historian of arts. But she is also a researcher of visual sources and testimony and that's what we could also focus on in our discussion and she's also a curator and her research that we are going to hear today will probably urge us not just to have a discussion but it will encourage us to do some other studies and research that's why i'm really looking forward to having a lecture and let me give the floor over to you. Let's go over to the presentation and then we will have a discussion. Thanks again for coming. And over to you. I hope your microphone is on. And I'm very, very sorry I don't speak Ukrainian. I feel very ashamed of it. And I will do my best uh, to speak a little bit more in Ukrainian maybe next time, I hope. And First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to our Leap Center for Urban History for this invitation, uh, especially uh, to you, Sofia. And I just have to say that it's a very important and eventful time for me to be here. And I just have to say that this is a place which is most beautiful and most powerful in the world and I feel honored to be here and I would like to express my gratitude and support for all of you from the depth of my heart and again it's an honor and also great uh, joy to be here today with all of you. And thank you for making this happening, Zofia and Andri. Thank you very much. Uh, I also have to thank several people from Warsaw who made it possible for me to work on this, this subject. Uh, of course, as it happens many times, uh, I believe that this is not you, the researcher who chooses the subject, but the subject chooses you, the researcher. So it was ex exactly the case. And my research would be not possible if not Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, especially if not great support of Monika Taras, who works in genealogy department, Anna przybyszewska drost who also works in genealogy uh, department, Michał Krasicki and Marta Kapelusz from um, art department and also I owe great thanks for the inspiration and, and scientific support to Professor Lauciak, Jacek Lauciak from Center for Holocaust Research in Warsaw and to Dr. Agnieszka Haska also from the same institution, Center for Holocaust Research in Warsaw and I will tell you later how their great support and this little coalition of researchers and, and archivists and um, uh, fantastic people made possible that I 
I was able to, to write this, this text. Uh, I have to say that um, this collection of uh, drawings and sketches by Fine were never researched before and they were never ever exhibited from 1942. Uh, they are held in the collection of Jewish Historical uh, Institute and I encountered them, them when I was looking for visual testimonies from the Holocaust, exactly from the time of the Holocaust. And I was also looking from, uh, for um, notations and reports of non-Jewish observers of the, of the Holocaust. And I encountered this, this very collection of more than 120 drawings. I don't know how many of them we have, because sometimes you have four or five or, I don't know, ten drawings on, on one card. Uh, so I encountered this, this set of drawings and I, I couldn't believe the fact that no one ever uh, wrote a word about it. So I started to research, and of course I was wrong. There was several sentences about this, this artist and this, and this work, but as it turned out, they were all wrong. So first of all, if you decide to look at this work uh, at the Jewish Historical Institute, you will encounter the museological card, as it is, and on the card you will encounter the information that these drawings were made by Ari Leon Fine. There's no evidence that Ari Leon Fine had anything to do with these very drawings. As it turned out, Ari Leon Fine did not even spend war and occupation uh, in Central Europe. He was in Palestine and he was much older artist, experienced artist. And as you can see, we also have very important information on the very uh, first card of the uh, Szkicownik uh, sketchbook, which tells us that the person who conceived these drawings was 12 years old in 1939, and this is very important uh, information. Then I also found out uh, two or three sentences about these sketchbooks and drawings in a very important book on um, uh, Jewish artists uh, between 1939-1945. It's a very important book. I deeply respect the, the, the author, but I don't know why, I'm not sure why, she, uh, Magdalena Tarnowska, wrote about this collection of, of drawings that they were conceived by a teenager, Ari Leon Fine, some you know, completely different person, on the Aryan side of Warsaw Ghetto. And again, there's no trace that they, they had anything to do with Aryan side of Warsaw Ghetto. Moreover, we have an information here that they were conceived in Lwów, in Lviv. So, um, uh, because I had no information, this is a little bit, you know, what art historians do when they don't know what to do, because there's a void, there's a limbo of information. So, because I had no information, almost no information about this, uh, this person, this, this uh, portraitist, I started to look very closely at each work and I started to describe and analyze and interpret them uh, centimeter by centimeter. I just uh, revealed this fact to Sofia that this is my kind of, let's say, methodology. Jan Tomasz Gross once wrote that once you encounter a nar uh, narrative testimony from the Holocaust, you should read it as poetry, word after word. So I decided to analyze this 
testimony, this visual testimony, testimony from the Holocaust, as it was uh, the most celebrated work of art ever, to uh, uh, give it as much time and attention and knowledge I could produce uh, having the experience and uh, knowledge I, I've already, uh, I already had. Uh, so I started with an analysis and I will lead you through this collection of drawings exactly in the same way as I was working for, uh, with them. So first of all, I will tell you about what you see and how we can analyze it or what kind of interpretation we can perhaps um, embrace. And secondly, we will start to search for the name of Fine. We will start to search uh, for his biography and micro-history. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, we have two, I would say, bodies of work. Uh, one part was conceived in 1939, as you see, by a 12 years old boy, and he was just to uh, start his grammar school. And these drawings are, I would say, impressions from his holidays time, from a wolf. This is, for example, Lwowska Trójka, so Lviv tram number three. Uh, this is second sketchbook, and this sketchbook is from 1939 again. And this sketchbook, there's a little note on them, which says a shelter on Wolność Street and a shelter on Frederi Street. So I was really moved yesterday when Andrei took me to his studio, which is next to Frederi Street. So the works from this sketchbooks, they were probably made in the shelter. And there are many, many people, there are many portraits in this sketchbook, and all of them are signed, fine, and you can also see the initials or the name of a person that was portrayed. And sometimes he's even uh, adding a profession. But I'm not going to talk about this collection from 1939, although it requires a lot of attention. And there's a lot of work to, to have been done on this part of Fine's uh, what I'm going to focus today is, as I said, more than 120 drawings from the period between March and August 1942. Uh, in these drawings, there is no mention about the place where they were made, but we have, again, name of the artist of the author, fine, and we have very exact date. They start in March 1942 and they, let's say, stop very suddenly in um, August 1942. As you can see, this drawing, because there are mostly portraits of women, men, and children, and they were conceived in one flat. Uh, in one flat, in the Lviv, in the Lviv ghetto. And uh, what is more interesting, the whole condition of this drawing is a testimony to the Holocaust. So, for example, the material, the card on which the drawings were made, are also very, very important. Actually, this one is pre-war um, uh, document, but this one, uh, this is the uh, uh, recto of, the, of this uh, drawing. This one is a kind of, let's say, 
project for an announcement of forced labor from the uh, uh, for uh, the um, uh, Tischlers and other professionals from from ghetto. So uh, we can say that uh, both the symbolic side, the iconographic side, and the material side of this um, of this collection is a testimony to uh, to the Holocaust. And as you can see, most of the drawings are dated and signed. This means that the drawer was very happy about his work. Some of them are not dated and signed, and this means that he, said, he had some reservations about them. So again, as you can see, uh, there are portraits of, of men, of boys, children, and of women. He was very fond of women. There are also drawings of the readings Fine was um, reading at that time. And uh, I will tell you later what I think he, he read. And there are also drawings which we can uh, call a drawings of fantasy. So this is a very moving drawing for me. I, for a very long time I didn't know what it was. And there's a little comment up over there, which says, is novo marzenie, a game, a dream. So it's a window through which he would like to look at. And looking at, the, at this window, probably we can see you know, the nature, the green trees and green grass and you know, space, um, some spacious place somewhere, but this is only a, a dream. There are also drawings like that. I would say this is a pure fantasy. And this, the, there are also drawings which I think are drawings of Fine himself. There's a set of self-portraits of, of this boy, and this is one of one of them. Uh, in this collection of drawings, there is a part which are which is deeply connected with a window. This one is connected to the window, and as you can see, the window is not only to uh, you know look through, but this is also a kind of image in an image. It's a kind of tautological concept. Uh, so we can say that, uh, for example, in this drawing, Fine is not talking only about his dream, but he's also, this 15 years old boy, is also a making a statement about art, about what image in itself could be. But there are also other uh, uh, drawings with, uh, with the window, like this one, or like this one. And for a very long time I couldn't understand them. I, I didn't know what it was about. There are really a lot of them. And uh, Professor Jacek Leociak um, was a great help in understanding what is a window, considering Holocaust um, symbolical universe. So I will quote uh, his great uh, analysis of textual accounts from the Warsaw Ghetto where window plays a key part. The window is a crack into the horror. Macabre scenes were ubiquitous across the ghetto. In the ghetto, the window divided space into the familiar and the unfamiliar. One looked at the alien and dangerous street from one's flat or hideout with a sense of relative safety. This division, however, was only apparent. Both in spatial sense, after all, everything was happening in one separate and closed world, and existentially too. For looking through the window at the horrors of the ghetto, one saw one's own fate. One was looking at oneself. 
uh, browsing through uh, Fine's legacy, uh, one gets the impression that the boy almost never went to the window. He was reluctant to do it. He refused to look through it. And if he did so, he gazed in the sky. He was trying not to look down. However, the window that appears in Fine's work is still a window that looks out on the Holocaust. It is the boundary of both psychological and physical integrity beyond which danger and death lurk. It is a ceaselessly resounding visual echo that accompanies the portraits, self-portraits and nudes. The window connects the inside with the outside, the intimacy and safety of the flat with the everyday extreme danger of the street. And we can even ask that perhaps for fine, the window also set a limit that what could be depicted. The window in his drawings can be interpreted as a visual thought on the activity of representing the external and internal world that is just about to be destroyed. I understand it as a very thin membrane of representation that barely provides a makeshift, temporary protection against the unfolding catastrophe. Fine also emerges from his drawings as someone who is very curious about the world and his surroundings, who depicts his loved ones and friends in private, intimate moments, and who dreams of a better world, who loves, who desires, and who is perhaps in love, as we will see. His drawings differ in character. He portrayed boys, some young women and men, occasionally people of nature age. Other drawings were illustrations of his readings, but I will tell you that later. Now I would like you to see some of his portraits of men, children, and women. This is a very young man, an adult, and I would like to uh, uh, look at the crossings. I will tell, tell you more about this crossing a little bit later. A child he was very linked to, he was uh, playing with this child also through the drawings. Again, young man. And readings of fine. Uh, there are readings, probably he was reading Sienkiewicz, I think, Trilogia. Uh, that's why you have these fantasies of, you know, 17th uh, century, you know, Poles in this arms. And he was also sketching a lot. Uh, he was experimenting, you know, how to how to uh, reproduce, how to depict a uh, human body. And he was also very fond of uh, uh, representing people who were reading books. So uh, several of his drawings are depicting, like this one, uh, young uh, men uh, or boys reading a book. This one is sitting on the couch. This one is sitting next to the table. This is again fine during his readings. And this is a great, great um, drawing. A man who is reading very bad news. And you can see that this news are bad because he's reading a newspaper, probably you know about you know some news about the, the front line and uh, what is going on in the in the world. And you can see the death and the devil uh, up uh, in the upper part of the of the drawing. He was also drawing comic books like this one. And he was particularly uh, fond of portraying young women. Uh, 
usually the portrait of uh, women uh, is full length and the woman is sitting or the woman is sitting on or the chair or she's standing and he was very uh, particular about conveying the model's facial features, physique and personality, and also the prevailing atmosphere or the nature of the relationship between her and himself. Several of the female models stand out in particular. So uh, this one, for example, I think that was someone very close to the to the boy. Uh, there are a lot of portraits of this young, beautiful woman, and I would also would like to focus your, your attention on the fact that you can't really see the bands uh, Jews were required to use in the ghetto, but. Sometimes they are visible in a very discreet way, like on this, like on this drawing. Actually, I think that perhaps this woman, this very woman, was his uh, older sister. A mature woman. And also he was drawing nudes. And this woman, he, well, he had a very particular relation with. She was also posing for him as uh, as a model in his uh, and his nudes, but when we compare these two acts, this one is very academic. He was just teaching himself how to, you know, depict naked body, which is um, one of the biggest challenge in uh, artistic education. But these nudes are somehow different. They are very erotic in nature, I would say. There is kind of floating desire, and perhaps, you know, he's seeing first time in his life a beloved body which is naked, and he's in, you know, the uh, drawing of this body is also an act of admiration and, and love, perhaps. When you look at these drawings of, uh, of women, you cannot say that these are, this is a Holocaust art, yes? That these are drawings from the Holocaust. And I was also think about, thinking about this fact, what is going on in these drawings. They are, these women are extremely beautiful. They are, they are very well dressed, uh, well groomed. Um, and I think this portrait of women made by fine are kind of acts of reparation. So they were not looking like that. Of course, they were not looking like that. But uh, in this act of uh, 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 beautification of his models, perhaps young artists uh, wanted to make them feel better. Maybe he wanted to cheer them up. Maybe he wanted to offer them a moment of forgetful, forgetfulness and respite. And we know a lot of examples like that, even from the art and depictions from the camps, where, for example, Maya Berezowska, a very well-known uh, Polish artist, uh, portraying women, he was, um, uh, she was, um, conceiving extremely beautiful portraits uh, uh, of, uh, I would say, not a real person, but uh, someone he wanted just to cheer, she wanted to just to cheer up and somehow uh, support through the process of uh, drawing. So again, And as I mentioned before, uh, in this collection, I think there are several portraits of Fine, of Fine himself. And uh, I started to think about these depictions in this way, because as this one, 
they, they were made in the mirror or, you know, self-portraying himself. He was portraying himself during the act of portraying. So you can see the, the, the pencil or the, the feather and the, the, the sketchbook. And sometimes, as you see, the portrait looks like that. And it's very strange because, again, as you see, he was very happy about this portrait. He signed it, he put a date, and then he, he crossed it. And there are also portraits like, like that. There are also portraits like that. There are self-portraits. There are most, I mean, a lot of portraits and self-portraits in this collection of drawings had, have this strange component of erasure. And sometimes it's very simple because the uh, artist wanted to spare the space for the next drawing. It's clear. But sometimes it's not clear because he's erasing the face and leaving the drawing with the date and with his signature, like in this, uh, in this case. There's also this very extreme uh, drawing, which is uh, totally erased, I would say. So he drew his self-portrait, and then he erased his self-portrait, but in such a way that the traces of the erasure could be visible. And I think this is the most powerful self-portrait I've ever seen, considering um, Holocaust uh, depictions. This is also a kind of self-portrait, I would say. As you see, uh, the work shows only the hand equipped with a feather, and it's a kind of uh, self-reflexive tautological joke but at the same time, an, an uh, artist's portrait, a portrait of his um, uh, skills of uh, of himself as a of, of himself as a as an artist. Uh, I would also say that considering the fact that this drawing was conceived in Ghetto in 1942. This is not only a drawing of a drawing. We know many examples like that, from Renaissance art up to, you know, today's art. But this is not only a drawing of a drawing. This is also a testimony of testimony. This is also bearing a witness to witnessing in this very moment, 1942. So, we can say that perhaps Fine records his own disappearance and reappearance, like, as Roland Barthes would say, ashes thrown to the wind. And what remains is the representation of the drawing hand and the drawing imprinted in it, which is the only literal proof of existence. And when I saw this drawing, I just, I was really shocked. It was kind of existential shock because I understood that this drawing, this, this collection of drawing is the only trace of existence, uh, not only of fine, but also of all these people he portrayed. And we don't know any name of these people. So this is a very paradoxical situation because uh, mostly, we know the name of a victim and we are looking for an image, a face. And here we have lots of images. We have a proliferation of faces and we don't know any, any name. So I decided to search for a name. And I had, I would say, uh, several threads. Uh, so first, of this um, very uh, helpful thread was uh, a note left by someone very special, 
Yusuf Zandel, Jewish art historian, who in the late 40s left this note in Jewish Historical Institute. And it says, fine. He didn't know his name. Fine. Date and uh, place. Uh, dead. Died during the occupation in Lviv ghetto. So it was the proof for me, very, very important one, because it was many of my friends, you know, in, you know, criticizing positively what I was um, researching, was, were asking me, so, you know, where is the proof that this is Lviv? That was one of the proofs that, that this is the Lviv uh, ghetto. So it says, um, died uh, during the occupation in the Lviv ghetto. And he, moreover, uh, Zandel writes, as 15 years old boy died in uh, Lviv ghetto and left highly mature works, drawings and apparels, uh, which were um, transmitted through Christian doctor to a uh, Jewish institution in, in Warsaw. Mm. Uh, in Warsaw in 1948. Actually, we don't know if it was 1948 or if it was 1949, but this Christian doctor was a very important, again, lead. Uh, I had many problems with that because on the museological card in the um, uh, Jewish Historical Institute there is a donor of this work, but his name is Pakchikovsky. And I couldn't find anyone called Pakchikovsky. And one of my great uh, friends, researchers, Agnieszka Haska, who is highly experienced in, um, uh, in searching for, for names, also for, you know, names that are kind of mistakenly written down, she found out that it was uh, not Pakchikovsky, but Paklikovsky. And when we found out this fact, the whole sphere of knowledge just, you know, burst out. So, I found out that Dr. Paklikovsky, uh, he lived in Lviv with his whole family, and he was a doctor, a colonel, a great admirer and collector of art. And moreover, during the war, uh, his uh, daughter, Wanda Binnitska Paklikowska, and her, uh, her um, husband, Alexander Winnitsky de Radziewicz, they were helping uh, the uh, Jewish couple, Serafina and Karol Ferster. And Serafina and Karol Ferster, they were a great friends of Mendel Schmierer Reif. And Mendel Schmierer Reif is the author of a collection of drawings that Dr. Paklikowski gave to a, a Jewish institution preceding Zich uh, together with Fine's collection. So, you know, all these people were uh, involved in saving uh, Fine's corpus of work, but also I found out that it's not an uh, accident that the drawings of Mendel Schmierer Reif are somehow, you know, embedded uh, in this uh, donorship. And I found out that Mendel Schmierer Reif who was a well-known caricaturist before the war in Poland. Uh, he lived in Warsaw, but uh, with the beginning of, um, of the war, he changed Warsaw for Lviv. And he also he was imprisoned in Lviv ghetto. And I started to research you know, who he was and what he was doing in Lviv ghetto, and I found out that he lived on Cherehova Street, and that he was um, involved somehow in one of the departments and uh, he was responsible in conceiving work cards for Jews who were working outside the ghetto. And uh, I was, you know, I started to research he, what he did, what was in these work cards. 
and researching that online from the collection of um, Holocaust Museum in Washington, I found out that there are four names with the name, uh, uh, four cards with the name Fine. Only four. And two of them, two of these cards depicted, uh, well, not depicted, but two of these cards were dedicated to Clara Fine, who was identified as a hosiery worker and uh, living at Ulica Rękodzielnicza 5. And Clara Fine, as this card says, was born in 1923. And the second card that was very important to me was uh, dedicated to Isaac Max Fine, born in 1921, and he was a laborer living at the same address. So Rękodzielnicza Street, Clara Fine and Isaac Max Fine. And I'm talking about that because I don't know why, I just, I just started to think that some of these men depicted in these drawings and perhaps one of the women uh, depicted in these drawings are Isaac Max and Clara Fine. That was only my imagination, but I think sometimes you can allow yourself to work also with your imagination. Then I was in a dead point. No information, nothing. So what do you do when you have no information and you are not a skilled historian? I'm not a skilled historian, I'm an art historian, a visual uh, culture historian. Well, in my position, you go to the genealogy department in Poland or in Jewish Historical Institute. So I went to Jewish Historical Institute asking for help, Monika Taras and Anna Dros Przybyszewska, and they are responsible for, you know, what happened next. So, they started to research many databases, and one of these databases was uh, Gesher Galicia database, and they found out in Gesher Galicia database that there is a Clara Regina Fine, child of Adolf and Etelka. There is no Isaac Max Fine, we don't know why, but moreover, there is a, another boy, Bernard Henrik Fine child of Adolf and Natelka, and with a date of birth, 2nd September 1926. 2nd September 1926. So, you know, with great cautiousness, I just started to think, oh, maybe that's him. Maybe 1926. So he was just turning 13 in that moment when he was, you know, conceiving his drawings after the summer, uh, of 1939, that's why he, he wrote now, oh, I'm 12, yes, because he was not 13. And uh, uh, Monika Taras and Anna Dros Przybyszewska also um, checked for me the genealogy of Adolf and Etelka. And they found out that Adolf and Etelka Fine had four children. The oldest one was Adela. The second one was Isaac Max. The third one was Clara Regina. And the youngest one, very, very uh, late child, so he must have been beloved one, was Bernard Hendrik Fine. So I was pretty sure that they were living at the same address, yes, at Rękodzielnicza Street. But since he was very young, he was not a forced labor and he was not working outside ghetto. And the cards uh, conceived by uh, Reif uh, were linked only to those who worked outside, outside ghetto. I also found out that um, Adolf Fine was a merchant and he was very well off. And probably, you have to help me with that, probably the whole family lived on Michała Street, Ulica Michała, and Ulica Michała was on Podzamcze, and during uh, the Soviet times, they, the, the name of the street, uh, Michała, was turned into the name Rękodzielnicza. So it was the same name, the same address. They were living, actually, you know, 
in the in, in, in the space which became also the the place of Lviv uh, ghetto. Um, I also find, found out, and I, I have to tell you that I was really it was like um, proceeding in a dream. I, uh, because this, this, this knowledge just bursted, um, bursted out. I also found out in his uh, very early drawings that probably before the war, uh, young Fine, Bernard Henrik, was attending the King Batory school because he was depicting, of course, you know, as a caricaturist, the teachers from this school. And I don't know the history of the school, but I just found out one of the teachers, very well known, Václav Maybaum. And there is Václav Maybaum caricature in the sketchbook, and uh, that was exactly one of the teachers. I, I guess he was history teacher in Stefan uh, Batory um, High School. Uh, yes. As I said, the, the history of these drawings ends in August 1942. So probably Bernard Henrik Fein, as many others depicted in his drawings, didn't survive the so-called Wielka Aktia, Great Action in Lviv Ghetto in August 1942. Uh, but uh, I guess we don't know his, his fate. We don't know what happened to, the, to him. If he died of hunger, if he was murdered, if he was deported to, to Belgium, if you encounter any information on this boy or about his family or his friends, I would very much appreciate it. This is not the end of the story. This is, you know, several puzzles from the huge image of someone's micro history and biography, life. So, what to do with this collection on the interpersonal level? As I mentioned, I'm uh, working with uh, the concept of visual testimony since I think that in historical work on Holocaust, visual testimony, testimonies are um, not, I would say, not greatly appreciated. There is a dominance on, I, I would say, there is a focus on narrational um, uh, testimonies. And I think that visual testi testimonies, they also had a great power and a, a, a great mass message which we are obliged to, uh, to read. So, thinking about these images, I started to use the term visual relational uh, testimony to uh, think about the drawing not as an object only, but also as a process of process which constitutes a relation between the portraitist and someone who is being portrayed. And of course the effect is important, but what is even more important here is the process itself, the relation, the support, the care, uh, you know, the emotion which goes together with the process of, of uh, depiction. So I understand Fine's portraits as an active exercise of the hand, the eye, and the mind, as seeing, discovering, <coughs> observing, knowing, constructing knowledge, entering into multiple relationships with people and things, with the historical context, and with that which cannot be seen, not because it is overlooked, but because it gains visibility in the drawing in the drawings as the all-encompassing space of the Holocaust. Holocaust which is happening beyond the drawings, outside the window, and yet 
it is embedded in each of these portraits. So they are, for me, about approaching and distancing, depicting, remembering and erasing the fixed image, followed by another attempt of depicting anew at the threshold of the present and of memory. I think that fine relational visual testimonies, just like Fine himself, participate in the events and experiences they report, as well as in those unreported, non-represented, yet remaining in close relation to them. In Fine's case, the portrait, self-portrait, or nude, as relational testimony, has reference to a specific real person, and therefore provides meaningful information about him or her, triggering a process of cognition in which he or she, the portrayed person, simul simultaneously participates. In addition to the representational, formal, iconographic and symbolic layers, as I mentioned before, the paper as the physical medium and the tools used to make the drawings also serve the role of seeds of knowledge concerning the material conditions of living in the Lviv ghetto. If the horror of the camps defies imagination, then each image snatched from such an experience becomes all the more necessary, wrote Georges Didi Uberman. If the terror of the camps functions as an enterprise of generalized obliteration, then each apparition, however fragmentary, however difficult to look at and to interpret, in which a single cog of this enterprise is visually suggested to us, becomes all the more necessary. So I think that Fine's images belong to the vast archives of Shoah. And in regaining life in the little flat in Lviv ghetto, in portraying Fine's friends and loved ones, in leaving traces of relationality, love and care, they counteract the violence and death happening daily on the ghetto's streets and beyond. They are images, in spite of all, perhaps the only one evidence of existence of the people's fine depicted, visual traces of faces and bodies, depictions that almost miraculously survived. They carry on the visual testimony saturated with remembering, care, emotions and imaginations, which is perhaps the very last message from the Abyss of Pain, the Lviv Ghetto. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And I have to say that I'm, I'm deeply moved because this is the first time when Bernard Henrik Fine is returning to Lviv. I would love to thank you with all my heart for this occasion. And I think I'm just a little, perhaps, caretaker of, this, uh, of these images. And I think, um, you know, two years ago, I would you know, never imagine that this situation would, would have place. So thank you, thank you, Zofia, that in spite of all, you know, you just created this, this wonderful situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, dear Lisa, for you know bringing um, Fine home, but also visiting him in his home because it's actually it's a both the the move of um, enabling and also the move of discovery. And I mean, he's still there. It just that we don't see him, and you are helping us to see him and to see through him. And I think that's um, this incredibly well uh, and valuable. And I do know that there would be a whole there are questions on translation. And, uh, so I do know that there are questions and comments. Uh, that please do. I please do. <laughs> you, yeah, we need the conversation here. 
Uh, but to begin, and as you use this um, the metaphor and the very physical description of his home, I would like to ask you, you know, how do you see uh, the home for his story, like epistemological homes? Where does he belong? Where we are able to find him and how many? You know, his works are in Warsaw. I mean, his ashes are somewhere here. You don't know where. His life was here. Uh, his story is uh, a testimony of the Holocaust. Uh, but also of more. Um, so he's um, in Polish, Jewish, Ukrainian. Uh, I mean, you kind of, you know, we need to hold these experiences of the liminal and of the extreme just makes us to rethink the very basic assumptions, knowledge, and words we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's also something that. Um, like what you said about ghetto, you said Lviv uh, ghetto, Lviv ghetto. And I think that you know, we kind of have, uh, first of all, we do not really have the history of Lviv ghetto, just to begin. <coughs> I think a lot of what we were working with was based uh, on the research uh, on Warsaw ghetto, which is yeah. like the definitive yeah. for now. Mm -hmm. Or how we actually see what do you think about ghetto yeah. in general? Yeah. So it's a point and research which allows this uh, generalization, which yeah. calls for correction, like or for nuance. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and for that we do probably. That's my question: What the history of the ghetto would bring, and we can have this uh, conversation. But you know, coming like then you say leave, and then correct leave ghetto, and just kind of. So that you know there is a city and there is a ghetto, right? So that there is this separation, and then you could also actually like flip that and think that actually the city is the ghetto, mm -hmm. because in the ghetto people from all you know all different areas in the city mm -hmm. are moved and forced to live. Mm -hmm. So it's like essential city mm -hmm. is there. It's actually not on the big boulevard and there. Like mm -hmm. Aryan side, mm -hmm. but actually, so where do we place the city? Because ghetto, mm -hmm. like you know, when we use this this correction, we kind of also follow the narrative of the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. Like, how can we also define that? Yeah. Def define that in a way, and and probably the last one because I have so. Um, you know, what represents human existence? Name. What you said that you know they used to list. And name and it's actually one of the sources that we mostly have that's in the source that comes from a thought you often actually name and surname and then they come in the document or they come in the list which kind of even more problematic which more dangerous than the document mm -hmm. you put on a list right so it's something that is very personal but also very social right? mm -hmm. and uh, and then you know like, the story of uh, the story is told or the narrative or the, so the, this problem is define that, defy that, mm -hmm. and challenge is the power of name, mm -hmm. like putting a face, which is much more individual in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. And and how we and how we work between these images. And I was like thinking how in how we got two works of. Of a, a historian, um, French historian and Afro-American historian literature, and how I would be also curious how you, so critical fabulation, Sadia Hartman, mm -hmm. you know, and the, and also, so she writes about Afro-American life, and then you, what do you do writing a history when you do not have sources? So it's not the problem of people who lived life, it's the problems of us not having sources. Yeah. Or looking not in the, like, or, or being, like, mm, biased. Uh, and, but then, you know, what, what is the role of imagination? So another historian is Ivan Yablonka, who wrote the book, uh, uh, The History of Grandparents I Never Knew. So he's kind of trying to research the Holocaust history, 
and he has very little documents. And we have so many, so much of life has very little documents to begin with. Uh, so it's about violence. It's, it's very pertinent to the history of violence, yeah. to the stories of violence, experience of violence, but not only. Well, so how do we, how, how you navigate the work of this like, critical fabulation, as Hartman put it, or imagination? Mm -hmm and informed imagination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what is mm -hmm. your what your experience of working not between the lines mm -hmm. and the documents but between the, the drawings. So here it's um, yeah and, and thank you once again and I will give uh, you and then we'll we will raise hand and uh, yes please we'll do comment and thank you so much for this really fundamental questions and I I'm not sure if, I, if I'm able to answer them, yes, but I will just reflect on them. I, well, first question, it's like a magnificent question. I, I, I think that he's one of, you know, of this, of this homeless. And yet he has many homeless. So I think that his works on the epistemological level, we are talking about that, uh, but in different contexts. But they somehow, I'm looking for a word, disperse the national concept of history and art history. Yes, so we have like Polish art history, German art history, American art history. These are very na nationalistic concepts. We should, you know, say farewell a long time ago, yes? And I think this is one of these cases. Uh, because he was Jewish, he was Ukrainian, and he was Polish. His works are uh, in Jewish Historical Institute, but they are from Lviv. So this is probably also why no one worked on them, because the knowledge about Lviv ghetto in Poland is very, very little, very limited. And also my knowledge is very limited. That's why I just think that what you are doing here in the center is just amazing work, so much needed. Because Lviv ghetto is not only about Lviv ghetto. It's uh, also, a, 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 of course, it's a part of Holocaust history, but you don't understand Warsaw ghetto and Krakow ghetto without leave. And uh, thank you so much for your remark that my interpretation was very much based on the Warsaw ghetto kind of uh, epistemological uh, idiom. But uh, I have to work on it more, yes? Uh, I would say enriching my knowledge what uh, the Wolf ghetto was, and as you say, it was completely different considering, for example, permeability and topography and, you know, who was in, who was out, than Warsaw ghetto. Not mentioning Wuch ghetto, it was completely different, I would say, universe. And yet, it was connected to Warsaw ghetto. And you cannot understand, for example, uh, Erna Rosenstein, without thinking about the deep ghetto. Uh, so th this, this would be one, uh, one thing. I also, I'm trying to work with this concept of, you know, art history or cultural history beyond uh, national concepts. Yes, yeah? so I'm, I'm trying to find out a concept that would be perhaps a home for Fine and many other artists. And I, I started to think about the concept of something like diasporic art history. So, you know, a, a kind of scarred art history with many centers, with many, many places. Uh, so I think that, that that would be one, perhaps, ma mode of working with, with this. Uh, this uh, legacy. Um, I also think that um,
such testimonies, such visual testimonies, conceived by a teenager. So no professional training. And yet we cannot say that he's not an artist, yes? Because he's highly skilled artist. But even if he was not a skilled artist, I don't care, to be honest. But he is, I mean, he's a highly skilled artist. But even if he, if he wasn't, uh, this is a problem of art history. Because art history, um, I would say paradoxically, is based on a very modernist concept. Yes, and well, these concepts are like that. Uh, originality, uh, innova innovativeness, what else? Uh, workshop skills, and oh, there is something I really hate. Um, let's say semantic productiveness. Yes, and we can say, okay, he's he's skilled on the kind of workshop workshop side very much, but these are not, let's say, original in the in the terms of style drawings. Yes, they are realistic portraits very emotional, very intimate, but there is nothing original in them. And this is something I really value a lot, yes? that he was not that much uh, focused on uh, building his own language, but he was focused on building the relation with these people, of uh, beautifying them, of giving them comfort, perhaps. This is something I I value much more than um, stylistic, uh, stylistic. I would say innovation. And I think that, so. The, the set of I would say preconceptions, perhaps next to the lack, not lack, but very little knowledge on Lviv and Lviv ghetto, perhaps were the uh, the the origin on why this set. This, this vast set of, of drawings were never researched, yes? This vast set of drawings in one of the key archives of the Holocaust, Jewish Historical Institute. So that will be my answer to your first question. Uh, Sophia, the, 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 the second and third... I'm sorry, I have COVID and that's why... That's why I, I have... That's like, a long one. Like, that's a long one, yeah, it can be a long one. Imagination. So this, how do you? Thank you. Yes. You oh, thank you so much. How we? Yeah. Especially once you, once you work with, um, with Holocaust history and uh, testimonies. I'm trying to be very cautious and modest. I would say. So I'm kind of limiting myself. But also, I'm trying not to pose, it's, it's a kind of a question of style, yes? So I'm trying not to, po not to uh, make uh, a very strong statement, but rather to pose questions. Was he, perhaps, what if, etc., etc. So this is a, a kind of moment when, I, when I'm trying to transmit this knowledge to, uh, let's say, my reader, that this is my imagination, maybe, why not, perhaps I'm wrong. So I'm, I'm trying to be very exact, you know, kind of stylistically, what I found in the archives, what is a, an effect of research. Of course, it's never, it's never ending, yes? I don't believe in facts, facts are cons constructed. But I'm trying to be very exact, what is a research and what is my kind of way uh, to understand or what is my next step in order to uh, search for you know his name and his biography etc but I have to know to, to tell you that uh, maybe I'm, I'm just you know lucky one until today maybe this situa situation will change but until today uh, I would say that the uh, you know imagination and research and uh, archival research and consultations because I, I also you know believe in in conversation in discussion in sharing research 
in talking to others. In the, I don't I don't believe in knowledge that is like common knowledge. I just don't think it's my individual, you know, uh, way. But I, I have to discuss, um, and I, I love to, uh, you know, be in discussion with uh, with others. Uh, so I'm trying to be very exact, you know, what is the archival research, what is the effect of discussions, and what is my imagination. And I, I, I have to say that I'm lucky because these three components, they kind of play together. And uh, hopefully I did not encounter a failure, a kind of complete failure. So maybe I will, you know, I will encounter one, but I also think that failures are uh, very uh, necessary in your, you know, professional uh, um, career. Yes, failures are the fundaments of uh, creating knowledge. So I'm not afraid of failures, but I always, you know, pose questions and question marks. I don't like the position of, you know, stable knowledge of, you know, master researcher of someone who is, you know, a master of knowledge and, um, and omni, uh, omni, um, omnipresent and omnipotent um, uh, academic. So this is, you know, I'm a kind of hundreds of uh, galaxies far from this, this position. So that, that would be my, you know, kind of reflection, not even an answer, but kind of no, set of <laughs> reflections. You know, and, and some questions. So, um, yeah, comments, questions. Možná anglickou, možná ukrajinskou. My comment and question goes quite different direction. Planetary, different galactic. I want to come back to the visual side of these images and to the question of nakedness. Uh -huh. And my suggestion is, of course, your perception is your perception, and you can legitimately uh, interpret uh, this um, the set of images in that way. But my understanding of this nakedness is so away from eroticism. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thinking about the intimate situation of these drawings. People are in ghetto are uh, embedded to very small space yeah. and they are a kind of a locked there. Mm -hmm. And in these images, a uh, painter or artist is doing something which unlock this locked space or using it for the most appropriate way it can be used when people are free. They mm -hmm. can be private, they can be intimate, they can be naked in wow. such a space. And at the same time, uh, when you have shown us a couple of images where bodies which are dressed or even buttoned up could be crossed out or could be um, um, somehow uh, partly erased, this nakedness is not erased not even one time as much as I see. Yeah. So this na yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this nakedness is vulnerable, but at the same time, this is a level of intimacy, the level of seeing, penetrating, if you wish, mm -hmm. which could not be possible outside, but mm -hmm. only is possible inside. And it's yes. like making an advantage of a very disadvantaged situation. And my question would be, as much as I can understand, this young artist is so young. So uh, the situation which I observe now in Ukraine with the generation of very young adults, not kiddles, but very young adults, in the circumstances of this great and uh, uh, omnipresent war. They grow adult very fast. They are actually more adult than they should be according to their age. Do you feel like we have something about this in these images as well? that the gaze of this young guy is more mature than it should be. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for, you know, sharing your comment with me. This is like outstanding comment, you know, about intimacy and, uh, you know, the things that could happen only inside, yes? Because the, you know, the argument about this set of drawings was very often, oh, they say nothing about, you know, the reality of the ghetto, which is, 
which is not true, yes? They say a lot about the intimate reality. We don't know anything about the house. Oh, we know very little, okay? We know very little. And this is exactly what you said. I would say that, well, I can, I can just, you know, express my gratitude for, for your wonderful comment. And yes, of course, I, I, I think that uh, also I, I encountered this argument, you know, that, uh, oh, it's not possible. He was 15 years old, you know, such nerds. I said, well, I have a son, you know, at that time I was researching that, uh, uh, that drawings, he was 15 years old. So I know something about this age, yes. And, but even more, being 15 years old during wartime and Holocaust, where month after month, day after day, there are murder and death on the street, he, 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 he cannot look at, yes? It, it makes you very mature. You are not a teenager, you are an adult. He was a young man. So I, I totally agree with you. And I just think that your, your comment is outstanding and I just would love to, you know, wrote down your name because I, I would love to um, make a reference to your comment, if I, if I may, yes? Well, the name is not important. No, no, please. <laughs> I'm happy if I somehow no, no, this is, move this on is, the topic because you can move on the topic comment. not only with biographical detail mm -hmm. but also with interpretational detail. This is an outstanding comment. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. My pleasure. Thanks. And then we have one more. Hello, and thank you so much for this presentation. I am so deeply impressed with this finding that, uh, that there is actually someone who is researching these uh, paintings, drawings, and yeah, that's something I'm really under this impression. I have a few um, reflections and one question, and um, uh, I totally agree with you that this uh, very young artist is enormously skilled as for his age. Uh, that's me saying as an artist, uh, as an artist, and uh, yet I would say that probably we still can see some searches for um, not only realism. As for me, we have like really small hints for something which I would call even a little bit of impressionism, mm -hmm. expressionism, and probably even like modernism, but mm -hmm. uh, of course um, maybe I'm a little bit uh, romanticizing this story because I'm thinking that probably he would develop himself and his style to something much bigger and uh, yes, yes, I'm just, I'm really impressed with that. And also I'm thinking, um, I'm having a rather collection which is not that much connected to this, but you uh, saying that probably he was making the environment of all of these people much uh, pleasant, better, beautiful yeah. as they are close and all of these things and that would um, remind me of a photo which I uh, ran on, on the internet some I don't remember when uh, there was a woman who was posing um, in front of the uh, like a huge poster, let's say poster of something like jungles I would say and beside uh, this, the soul, um, was a ruined divorce. Um, I've never found anything else about this, like this was a, let's say, photo zone for people to take a photo and feel uh, better rather than come back to center from like a ruined divorce. Um, once again, I've never found anything else about this whole story, probably it's uh, the only one footage of this kind of phenomenon, let's call it like that. But I think that this story uh, of uh, our character find is also something about this, like people still will be searching for something uh, we took around. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, and also about you know about this remark as an artist about you know the kind of blossoming, let's say gift of drawing yes and I, I to be honest you know this this works they completely deny you know the the statement that there there was no language for you know transmitting the knowledge of what was going on 
There were many, many languages. We were, as art historians, just blind to them because we, it, it's such an egoist position, I would say, on the researcher's side, yes, that you require from the artists or people in the liminal situation, you know, innovativeness, yes, and building a new language, yes. And this is exactly what you said, that th this language, let's say, it's kind of vibrating language, yes, between so many, let's say, uh, ways of expression. And you, I, I don't think you are romanticizing it, but I, I also think that, you know, there's an impressionist, impre modernist, but romanticism too, why not? And I think it's vibrating, that's why are, they are so powerful because they are in between all these languages, because this is also a process of education. And, uh, well, to be honest, there are so many of these of the, of this drawings, so it, may, it, may, it meant that he was uh, drawing constantly, day after day after day after, so they were like compulsive drawings, yes? And there are so many people, but they are so different, they differ from each other so much. Also the self-portraits, these are not only self-portraits, but he's like, you know, trying so many ways in portraying himself. But I think this is exactly what you said, these vibrations in betweenness. Uh, this is one of the ways well, he just decided he would convey his message, yes? So, uh, yes, and it's interesting because also when I think about these historical scenes, that maybe this is his reading, but I'm not sure about it. It could be Sienkiewicz, but I'm not sure. I don't like Sienkiewicz. I, I never read it. I mean, no, I read something, but I, I'm not a fan of it. But the, the, there is also something else. The, the, uh, probably, because it was very well of um, bourgeois family, so probably they had a lot of albums, mm -hmm. art albums. So probably he was copying or, you know, trying to, let's say, compete with romantic uh, painters. So, for example, the scene of battle, this is like a very romantic type of, you know, painting who have like uh, thousands in Polish uh, museum, so maybe this is not. This there could be, you know, a traces of his readings, but also I think that he was working with albums, with art historical albums, and trying to somehow, you know, compete. Or maybe we know this uh, cases. Maybe just to copy, and you know, what does it mean to copy during March 1942? why when you do it so you know so many question marks but th these are all these you know new interpretational traces and i have to say that um i i think that his ever which is like huge really this is like one maybe one fifth of his of his ever it needs researchers so if any of you you know feel that may take this challenge from Lviv side, I would say that would be you know the, the best gift you know for this for this corpus of, of works. Okay. That was actually my question. I was going to ask if there are any plans how to work um, further with this uh, with these uh, drawings um, in a way of I don't know you personally or in a way of Lviv colleagues. Uh, if there are any plans that you can share. That would be nice to know because, as you said, this really requires a lot of work and mental attention. Uh, yes, I, I mean, I'm in the process of, of working on this. So this is not a finished work. I wrote one text that is waiting patiently for publication, but um, I'm in the process of, of researching and of thinking about about this this collection of of words and uh, i honestly i can only invite you to you know uh, participate and you know for example sometimes uh, of, uh considering other artists one of my phd former um, students and now phd students came to me asking oh what do you think if i would 
you know, research this artist. And I said, well, that would be great. There will be two of us. You know, think about, I don't know, Picasso. There are like thousands of people working on Picasso and no one asks anybody else, yes? So um, I, I think that really this, this work needs attention and, and further research, but also different perspectives. So one is only the beginning. And I hope very much that maybe there will be a, um, an occasion to um, organize an exhibition of these works, but also you know, linked with other works. So we are working on that. We are working on that. I hope very, very much that, that you know, this is my dream. To, this is really my my dream. And uh, but honestly, I, I think it, it needs uh, uh, also this different perspective. Yes, from other point of view, non-Polish point of view. You know, so uh, your cooperation is greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you very much uh, for sharing and I would ask about the one detail we can see on this image. Yes, the face of this uh, man is uh, crossed out. So how do you interpret this detail? Uh, if this image is also from Ghetto, uh, does it have uh, in common with the, uh, the fact this uh, uh, being and staying in ghetto makes you uh, de depersonalized you, or how do you interpret it? Yeah, thank you. In the other. That's a, a very serious challenge, how to think about it. Yes, there are many drawings like that, and these are not mistakes. Even if they were mistakes, that they would be very, very you know, interesting to me that we have a record of failures, yes? But these are no mistakes. And, uh, you know, as I said, when he was happy, that, that, that's quite easy. When he was happy about his drawing, he signed, he put a date, he was very exact about that. There are many drawings you can see he is not happy about, yes? Okay. And this one is crossed, as many others. And this one is very, very uh, also specific because it is in color. Mm. And he didn't have uh, he didn't have many crayons. Probably he was run out of crayons because there are only a few of them. Most of them are uh, in pencil. So what happened? I don't know. Maybe one of you know maybe one of the answers would be that this is a record of perishing people, people who are taken from the ghetto. He didn't know where, and he never encountered these people again. Or maybe he knew what happened. Maybe this is someone who died. Maybe this is someone who was murdered. Maybe that, that was someone who was deported. And this is this, his way. Because there are no records of his writings, yes? Except for this very first sketchbook. So maybe this, he, this is his visual record of, you know, this person is not with us anymore. That would be the, the one way of perhaps interpreting it. Interpreting, I, it's not a statement, it's an interpretation, very free one. But as you, as you said, I think that uh, this is even more visible when you think about crossings and erasures, considering his self-portraits, that this is very much about uh, kind of dissociation and kind of, you know, destruction of your own self and kind of despair and uh, I think you can describe it very cautiously of course in, in such terms and I think the, his self-portraits are 
you know, very strong statements also about his uh, psychological and emotional and affective state. And, you know, when I first saw this portrait, this erased portrait, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. This is, you know, one of the most, um, I would say, shocking statements of the destruction of your own self. And yet you know that there is something, there's still something, there's still you. There's something that cannot be destroyed. And that's why we see this image, because easily he could have erased it completely. So uh, I don't even have words, you know, to, I, I, you know, I'm, this is one of the images I, I don't know how to write about. I think I'm not able to write about it. Um, I'm not happy when I'm writing about it. And perhaps this is the good state, yes? But this is something I'm kind of left with. And that is working, you know, in my body also for, for you know, who I am and what I, what I do. So I, I think, that again, that your, your comment about you know, the kind of psychological record of what is going on with, with your personality, with your essence, is, you know, is amazing one. Thank you. And the self-portraits he doesn't cross out? He, he did, yes, he did. And also they are with dates. They are very elaborate. And we have to remember that he had a very, he, uh, you know, there are a lot of drawings, but paper was very valuable in ghetto. So crossing something out was not an economical, you know, uh, I would say choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, easily. He, there, when you see it, you see how many, it's like a spelling says. It's like one drawing erased after another, another, another. And, you know, the one that is on the top, you know, this is the one he's happy with. He was not happy with the one, you know, here. There is no signature and no date. So probably that was something he wanted to work more about. But there is this, this um, self-portrait. Mm -hmm. And it's highly elaborated and he crossed it. And it's June 1942, June. Very specific date, again. Yes, but I, I, I think that we have to be very, very cautious. Yes, there are no easy, you know, historians and art historians, they like, you know, this easy analysis and interpretations in kind of psychological or psychoanalytical way. Oh, we have to be very cautious about it. And this hatching becomes his artistic method. Mm -hmm. This hatching becomes his yeah. artistic method. Yeah, yes, very much. Yeah. yeah. Coming back to paper you mentioned. You know, so it's yes, yeah, actually in the in the in a dire situation, where do you place your priorities, right? So it's just mm -hmm. and uh, many things are lacking. Um, so I mean the, the very fact it seems that they were staying in the same building. Probably where they lived. Yeah. Probably the building changed because more people were living. So yeah, there are a lot it of was people. a lot of people. There are so lots of it's people. density, see. But you know, this is a stack of paper he got. You know, was he going to you know drawing lessons? You know, that's a question, you know, like yeah. that would he would they if they would be as many were displaced in the city. You know, and if you have in a limit of how many things you take and what is priority for, for you to take, you know, cloth, um, because it's so winter, could be, you this know, is this is a kind of, kind of, you know, staying in the same building, in the same apartment, probably part of the apartment. Mm -hmm. um, kind of also, I don't know, that's, that's a question, you know, of, because he, he has a lot of paper. That's the one. I, I will. I will start with uh, um, with something. I, only these are my kind of uh, interpretations. So I think that he knew Mendel Schmieder's life. 
that probably Mendelschmidt and Reif taught him drawing. Uh, so he had a teacher. So it's not a coincidence that their drawings are together. To be honest, it's interesting. I couldn't believe it because no one touched this set of drawings from 1949. And they were like uh, mixed up a little bit. Uh, and, but it's easy to recognize who is Schmier and Reif, who's like a caricaturist. And, you know, his line is like, it's like a signature, yes? Um, so I think they, they know each other. And probably, as, I, as I've uh, said before, Fine's family, probably they maybe had a little bit more, maybe they were in a, a little bit better economic situation than Mendelschmidt and Reif, and maybe that's why he taught this boy. Bernard Hedrick. And the question about uh, paper is a basic one, yes, for, for someone who is, um, who is a, a, a portraitist. I think that he could have had a kind of uh, uh, spare collection of, this is a very good paper to be honest. It, it's not uh, accidental paper. So, I mean, so, not, not all of them, but some of them. So I think that he had a kind of uh, spare pa paper maybe from before the war, or maybe, I don't know how it, how it functioned in the brief, I, would, I hope you will help me with that. But for example, in Warsaw, uh, uh, in, I don't know, 1940 or 1941, one shop for artists was, um, um, uh, was being closed. Yes, and all artists from Warsaw went there, you know, buying accidentally what, what they had. So, for example, Mieczysław Weyman, a Polish artist, he, he was a little bit late, and there were only, you know, plates for graphics. And he was not a graphic, but he bought this, this plates, the plates. And that's why he, uh, he started uh, to experiment with graphic, uh, graphic art, because this, that was, you know, the material he had. So maybe they, his family or himself, bought some paper just in case. I don't know. More interesting is who gave him the paper with projects for Nazi um, announcements. Mm -hmm. It could have been right. Who you know? Who, who worked as a kind of you know someone who is like responsible for all kind of I don't know visualities, so cards, announcements, whatever. So maybe this is this situation. They are also you know pre-war documents. So probably from uh, someone from this club just gave him you know something. Oh, you can draw on the other side. So uh, we have some names on that. So maybe it's a trace of of someone, yes. Um, there's a map. I don't know. So, you know, th 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 these are only question marks. But I think that, um, first of all, that he could have been a student of Reif. And, you know, the, the strange Nazi announcement, that these are not actually the announcement, that the projects, yes, uh, kind of polygraphic projects of announcement. That this is something that you know makes me think about Drive again. And the rest of it, I think that was his cohabitants who maybe, you know, they got the portraits, but they also supported him with paper. Right? So maybe that was the, the way. More questions, more comments? I think probably have one one more about this copying, you know, what is battle and historical images. And I think it's it's rather like, you know, whether he had album. I also the question if he was to museum in Lviv, right? You know, this Lviv Art Gallery is, oh, yes. up until now, is full of the Polish um, 19th century uh, historical paintings, so, and even more are not shown. They were, 
but it's also like you know like a thing of looking at you know, you know what is engagement with culture and we know that the city is very divided because galleries and museums are open they are functioning in the city opera gives performances you know if you look there's actually not that you know, there's still a lot to be studied or but leave on the German occupation, mm -hmm. but the values of cultural activities. Um, and of course, you know, German hierarchy of race and uh, position and playing with that. Um, when that, there was a lot of um, a calendar thing, cultural life in Polish, you know, the, you know, the university, um, and there were a lot of Ukrainian cultural life, which was not counted this time because it was allowed. So there were, you know, many exhibitions happening, opening, and you see, uh, you know, it's actually quite a different question for us to reckon. You know, what, I mean, what does it mean that you have a vibrant cultural life 500 meters from a ghetto or a kilometer? And I think that this this. The city is very dense and close, so that's a very good question where really cultural life is happening on the exhibition opened in art gallery or art museum in summer 1945-42 or in a drawing by a young man who is suddenly adult and uh, draws that because he cannot go to art gallery. So it's, uh, it's about you know, when you take the optics not only of Holocaust and ghetto, but really keep in mind the city. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank just, you. Really I mean, this is such a great um, remark. Of course, of, of course, though this is my perspective, which is so, uh, you know, uh, so much uh, imprinted with, uh, you know, errors and mistakes and presumptions, etc. Because I'm not uh, from Lviv, and this is my first time in Lviv, and I know so little about Lviv, so yes, you are absolutely right. Maybe this is this, you know, I can't go to the museum, so I will, you know, maybe I will imagine, you know, this painting again, if, you know, just as if I were there, yes? So, and you can interpret it, of course, it's a kind of reparative action. So, uh, yes, maybe these are not albums, maybe these are recollections from, maybe, you know, for example, National Museum, of course. And, uh, yes, I think that this, also this everyday, this vernacular kind of sphere of, of life is uh, very important to interpret these drawings because, for example, uh, you can see the, uh, which is very rare, you know how these people were, uh, what, what what they wore actually, yes, and what kind of um, uh, what kind of uh, furnishings they they had in uh, in the in the place, and uh, actually there are so many people portrayed, but as you said, you know there there were like twenty something people living in only two rooms, yes, uh, so prob it's possible that they were all living together. The, the strange thing is, but also we have to remember that this is a fragment of his, of his work, it's, it's a fragment, it's not the entire work, yes, we don't know what happened with the rest of the work, maybe it's something here, who knows, maybe it's something here. Uh, but. Um, uh, we we have to uh, remember that uh, he was also, um, you know, a on this edge of uh, a, you know young adult and uh, and a kid, and so he had he he was very mature, and yet he has he, his own I would say uh, ways to, uh, you know, um, analyze his uh, position or help himself or to uh, make more, let's say, 
make this kind of uh, situation bearable. Yes. So I think that, that this is a very uh, complex situation when you when we have to take you know so many perspectives of, for example, child psychology, but also you know this very very position as we were talking about as you know a child was being a young adult and matured person, yes, in the very drastic and liminal uh, uh, situation. So I, I just think that there are so many fields we have to <coughs> kind of um, uh, uh, put into uh, um, consideration that, uh, yes, it's a very kind of transdisciplinary and uh, transversal, I would say, uh, corpus of, of words, of articles. Thank you. Um, it's your first time in the leave, but I'm sure you will be coming back. And uh, you know something about the leave, you know something else. And I think it's a collective endeavor to, um, you know, to learn about this uh, very complex and rich place and, and life lived and destroyed here um, and remembered. Uh, so thank you for sharing. Thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank for, you for inviting me here. And thank you for you all to coming and um, and sharing your comments and questions uh, and um, uh, I would like to say that next week we will have also a question a lecture which will be on Zoom so check our website um, we will stay with visuality and with visual but we will move to France and uh, you mentioned one scholar and thinker towards the end of your lecture, so probably he will be brought again uh, next week um, because we will talk about French discussions on visual uh, representation of violence. So it will be in English on Zoom uh, next week. Mm. So thank you very much again. To, to be here and thank you for this evening and I as I said uh, before it's a it's an honor to be here with uh, you and it's an honor to be here in Ubi. Thank you.